Hi everybody, I'm just going to take a quick moment to run through the notes with you on the Chinese immigration and the new immigration so that hopefully they make a little more sense. First, let's start with the Chinese. They're a group that's somewhat, somewhat unique in terms of immigration policy because of the circumstances under which they came to the country in the first place. Uh, in, as you guys know, in 1848 and 1849, gold's discovered in California. Uh, which draws lots of people out west, white settlers on the east coast, but also fortune seekers from China, especially young men who want to come here and try their luck at mining for gold. And a lot of them don't strike it rich, but they do end up working for mining companies to try to extract that gold. Because of the boom in California and all the people settling out there, we have a need to connect California to the rest of the country. And so the Transcontinental Railroad is going to become extremely important during this time period. A railroad businessman named Leland Stanford, yeah, that Stanford, the guy who eventually will go on to build Stanford University, actually recruits a Chinese labor force to come over from China temporarily to build the railroads and then to go back home when the railroad is complete. He had calculated that it, it would be too expensive to get immigrants from Europe to come over, plus you have to get them from Europe, across the Atlantic, then across the continent to California. It's a lot more direct to just bring Asian immigrants over, crossing the Pacific and settling in Northern California. As the Chinese laborers make their way into the United States, they gain a reputation as being a really reliable, dependable, friendly, hardworking labor source. Um, in contrast to the Irish who are often stereotyped as problematic, they put up fights, they complain, and then there's obviously the stereotype of them uh, drinking, which the Asian immigrants are not doing at this time period. The Chinese are not known to drink heavily. So this is all well and good until the railroad is completed and once the Chinese labor source is no longer needed, they're expected to go back home, but they've done well in America and they see no reason to go back home. Why should they turn their back on all this opportunity? So they stay and when they stay, they end up competing with white laborers, which is obviously going to become a problem because not only are they really good workers, but they're willing to do the jobs for less money and that's going to be a threat to American labor. So America reacts to the Chinese in a couple of different ways at this point. Um, first of all, it reacts with some outward signs of violent discrimination. You guys read in the textbook about the Kearneyites, who were a group of Irish nativists who basically went out and rounded up Chinese people in the streets and attacked them, um, beat them, shot them, cut their hair, ridiculed them, lynched them, and hanged them publicly in some cases. So this is really just a nasty, nasty violent reaction to the Chinese by an immigrant group that had been in the United States only a few decades themselves. And so here you go, here's the cycle that we talked about in the last screencast about how older immigrant groups tend to look down upon newer immigrant groups. The western states like California start passing a series of laws that basically make it illegal for anyone who's not a citizen to own land. Um, and what's interesting about this is that it prevents the Chinese from ever um, becoming fully integrated into American society. They can't own their own farms, they can't own their own businesses, they can't own their own homes. And at first, on the surface, it seems kind of neutral, like, okay, well, that means that European immigrants who aren't citizens can't own property either, right? But the issue is enforcement. The law is only enforced for Asians. And how do you know that an Asian is not a citizen? Well, no Asians were allowed to be citizens because they hadn't been in the country long enough. And it was very easy because Asians had different physical characteristics than white European immigrants. It's very easy to single them out. The Chinese only make up a very small percentage of the total American population, but they make up a larger percentage of the population on the West Coast, especially in some of the cities on the West Coast, like San Francisco. And so it's in those cities, it's more obvious that the Chinese immigrants are there. Also, consider the gender ratio. These are young men who have come over to work on the railroads and in the mines, not a lot of young Chinese women. And so what you get is this sort of lopsided gender ratio where you've got a lot of single young Chinese men and not many single young Chinese women. And so those Chinese men are probably going to be looking for partners, for um, 
for wives, for mothers, for their children someday. And who are they going to be looking at? They're going to be looking at white women. And we've already talked about the fact that there's this huge taboo on inter-ethnic or interracial marriages during this period of history. So that's not going to fly with the white population. And of course, there's this paranoid fear that the Chinese men are going to be going after the white women. Um, the Chinese women who do come to America during this time period tend to have um, kind of questionable pasts. Maybe they're fleeing China because of things that happened there that they're trying to get away from. But a lot of them either are prostitutes when they come over or get forced into prostitution when they get here. So the reputation of Chinese women is a pretty negative one. And there aren't that many of them around to begin with. And so there, again, this kind of um, adds to the fear that Chinese men are going to somehow, um, you know, degrade or ruin the, the white women if they end up associating with them in any way. So Congress finally acts and applies this really super restrictive law um, specifically targeted at the Chinese called the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And this basically says we're going to shut the door on all Chinese immigration for 10 years. Not only will no more Chinese immigrants be allowed into the country, but the ones that are here will not be allowed to gain legal employment. And the hope is that this is going to force them out. They're going to not have any jobs here. They're not going to have any ability to make money. They'll go back to China. And so it's originally set up to last 10 years, but it works so well in the 10 years in terms of keeping Chinese immigrants out that they decide that they're going to extend it to 20 years. And they revisit it every decade. And in 1902, they decide this is going to become the law permanently. And it's going to stay into effect until the 1940s. We're not actually going to see any major widespread Asian immigration to the United States uh, as a major wave again until the 1960s when immigration restrictions are relaxed once again during President Lyndon Johnson's administration. So let's take a look at the effects of this law. First of all, Chinese people settled in the United States cannot become citizens ever, which means they can't vote. They can't serve on juries. So they're going to have some of the same legal problems and some of the same lacks of civil rights that African Americans have during this time period. They can't legally get jobs, but they're going to find ways to make money. Um, because they can't own land, they have to rent their apartments. They have to rent any shops that they are able to set up. Uh, and they have to rent any land that they could farm. Which means that they're going to be at the mercy of whoever owns those properties. Um, and you're going to have usually white landlords who are going to overcharge and they're going to have to deal with debt just like the sharecroppers did in the South. They're not going to make enough money to really live a decent lifestyle or have the ability to move up in social class in any way. And so some of the Chinese immigrants are forced to turn to illegal industries to pay off their debts. Things like uh, gambling parlors, opium dens, running prostitution rings, and so, of course, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. The white population already thinks that the Chinese are immoral. And now policies that are being put in place by white nativists are forcing the Chinese to do things that look immoral. And then in the end, the white nativists can turn around and say, see, look, we told you. They're not good people. They're immoral. We have to get them out. As we talked about before, the general attitude towards the Chinese as an immigrant group is that they're never going to become fully American. They're just too different. They're too foreign to ever really assimilate to American culture. They're never going to be accepted as real Americans, so we shouldn't even try with them. We should just try to send them home. Um, and so some do go home and that they are forced out and others who choose to stay kind of rely on the strength of their own communities to survive. And so that's where we see communities um, exclusive to the Chinese, like Chinatowns pop up around U.S. cities, and they're completely segregated ethnic ghettos that have very little interaction on a daily basis with white population, except in some cases um, to do some business transactions. But white people don't live in Chinatown, and Chinese people don't live outside of Chinatown, for the most part. Let's switch gears quickly and talk about the European immigrants at the time period coming in at the same time period, 1880s and 1890s, and this wave of new immigrants is going to continue until the early 1920s when more restrictive laws are put in place. 
But this is the second great wave of European immigrants to come into the country. You remember that the first great wave was coming mainly from Ireland and Germany in the 1840s and 50s and 60s, and these were primarily Catholic, but white European immigrants from northern Western Europe. This new group of immigrants, the new immigrants as they're called, um, are coming from Central and Southeastern Europe, and it includes a lot of Italians, Poles, Russians, Czechs, and for the first time in a major wave, Jews coming into the United States. And most of them are settling on East Coast cities. Um, New York's obviously the most popular, but everywhere from Boston all the way down to D.C., Philadelphia is also quite popular. You see a lot of these new immigrants settling into the urban areas. They're going to seem more different than the last group of European immigrants to come in. They're going to have different physical and cultural characteristics, um, and so they're going to seem less able to adapt to the American culture than the old stock. And then, well, of course, what we're going to see is that the immigrant groups that got here first, like the Irish and the Germans, they're going to discriminate against the new group of European immigrants coming in. And as I've used the analogy before, it's just like sophomores picking on freshmen. Now that the sophomores have been here a year, they feel like they're big and tough and they can boss around the new, guy, the new kids. We're going to see these new immigrants settle into ethnic neighborhoods or ethnic ghettos like Little Italy, which is probably the most famous of all of the ethnic ghettos in New York City. Um, and they're going to settle into these tenement houses, which you read about in your homework, these crowded apartment buildings, sometimes called the dumbbell or the barbell tenement, where basically a family has only a couple of rooms and they may only have one window in the whole apartment. Um, and they usually share a bathroom that's in the main hallway with the other families that have apartments on that floor. And so we see the development of slums of these really lower working class ethnic immigrant neighborhoods in the big cities of the East um, that you know are really pretty horrible. And a lot of these slums are torn down within 20 years of the new immigrants settling there because they just get so bad and so nasty. These new immigrants are going to contribute different music, different clothing, different foods, and different holiday celebrations to American culture. And over time, they're going to get absorbed into American culture. I think especially um, in New York City, if you look at the influence of Jewish culture and of Italian culture in New York City, it's pretty prominent. You're going to also see these groups establish religious schools because in one sense, they're not really welcome in the public schools. Public schools are still very heavily influenced by Protestant Christianity. And so to kind of protect their children and to also keep the old ways, they're going to send their kids to parochial schools, to Catholic schools, especially the Italians are going to do this. You're going to see the establishment of Jewish schools as well in New York City. Also, ethnic and social clubs will emerge to help these new immigrants to kind of uh, develop support networks, to speak their own language, to eat their own food, to listen to their own music. Kind of gives them a little slice of home, even though they're way far away from home. And as we get into the mid-1920s, we're going to see more and more government restriction on immigrants. And we're going to start using quota systems to actually put a limit on how many immigrants from each ethnic group will be allowed into the country each year so that we can control who's coming in. And what we see is that those quotas are going to really favor the whiter, more Protestant um, groups of Europeans coming over, the kind of the old stock that were coming over in the beginning. Um, and it's going to really have more restrictive policies towards Jews and Italians and, and people from Southern and Eastern Europe. So we see during this time period that America's face is changing, America, America's complexion is changing, and that's going to have major social, political, and economic consequences for the United States going forward. All right, I hope that this helped you guys make sense of the notes. I'm sorry that you had to do so much of this at home, but the calendar is what it is, and we will continue battling through. Have a great weekend, and I will see you next week.